Moving on, ladies and gentlemen, it is time for the next panel discussion. And the topic at hand is decoding ESG. Please welcome our panelists. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Uh, thank you for being here, my dear panelists and dear audience. Um, after a very, very hardcore communication sessions, two sessions, we are now getting into something which is more business. So please take a deep breath before we dive into decoding what does ESG stand for, environment, social, and governance, and how, is, how does that impact our lives? How does that impact our businesses? So I, you've met the panelists. I'll be very brief in my introductions. I'll, I'll be very brief in my co uh, comments and jump straight into this. Briefly, businesses are not isolated entities. They function within communities. They function within a framework of law. Uh, they use up a lot of natural resources. This is really what ESG is all about. The E stands for environmental criteria like energy, waste, and the consequences on the planet of using these or not, uh, and not disposing of some. It encompasses carbon emissions and climate change. Social refers to the relationship that your organization has with reputation, it maintains with people, and existing institutions. Labor relations, diversity, equity, and inclusion, the three very strong words which we keep hearing about these days. Governance is the internal system of practices, protocols, and procedures that a company adopts and employs in order to govern itself and make effective, decisive decisions and meet the needs of internal and external stakeholders. We talk about stakeholders, we normally think about external stakeholders, we don't think so much about internal stakeholders. Uh, but today, an internal stakeholder is as important as an external stakeholder. If you put all these three words together, it really just stands for responsible, sustainable business, which is good for the planet, people, and delivers profit. So I will now go straight to my panelists. I'll start with Sonal. Uh, Sonal is head of Copcom at Jindal Stainless and has been a practitioner for several years. So I will ask her to talk about her experiences. Yeah, thank you, Gayatri. Uh, before I start off on ESG, I'm so happy to see, uh, sit in a panel because I come from manufacturing, which where I can see women in the panel and even beyond that. It's a great feeling to come from a 5% women industry to a 50% women industry. Yes, so uh, talking of ESG, you know, um, uh, now 50% of the media queries I receive, uh, I'm from corporate communication, so answering to media queries is a part, main part of our KRA, is now directed towards ESG. So that is a clear indication on how the reputation compass is now pointing towards ESG as one of the main pillars, drivers of uh, corporate reputation. And for people in the practice on the corporate side, there is a discernible shift and the shift has been decadal. Uh, you know, pre-91, uh, uh, when I used to, you know, when I used to read about my company's narratives back then, it used to be how Swadeshi the company is, how it is rooted in the, you know, uh, in in the in the country's soil. Post-91, it was all about reforms and your capex and your investments and how you are in line with the Narasimhan uh, Rao government of driving more and more profitability. Then came the turn of the century and the age of internet and internet became your reputation pillar and how digitization and MIS was driving your business. Then after that, 2010 onwards and 14 is when CSR became compulsory, the 2% net profit. CSR became the buzzword and it is only of late in the last few years that we have seen ESG uh, as a far more mature, a far more expansive version of CSR, expansive because CSR only accounted for the social part of the business. whereas uh, environmental and governance parts were not as uh, uh, covered in CSR as they are covered in ESG. However, there is nothing absolutely brand new in ESG uh, from the standpoint of uh, corporate communications. You know, all these communications, even if you take the governance compliance, you know, waste to wealth, the training part, the diversity part, social inclusion part, everything was there, but it was scattered. 
It was in the BRR report. It was in the waste generation drives. It was in the conservation efforts that companies were doing. It was under different heads. It is to the credit of ESG that it has brought everything under one pillar and which is now the reason why corporates like us are gunning to ESG with all guns blazing and have taken targets to be net zero in the near future. A big shift for manufacturing. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Sonal. Uh, Sunil, can I ask you to make your opening remarks? Uh, well, I mean, you know, when one looks at uh, the whole question of ESG, uh, then uh, the form and the shape which ESG has taken today, there is a long history. It all started with philanthropy and then, you know, uh, a lot of corporates, even in the pre-independent India, were doing some philanthropic activity in terms of uh, setting up hospitals, setting up, uh, you know, uh, educational institutions and so on and so forth. And they used to consider that to be an extension of uh, whatever profit they are earning, so give it back to the society. But over the years, what has happened is that the trust which society had in most of the economic enterprises, that trust no longer exists in the sense that uh, it all began with the fact that the civil society or the people in general believe that corporations, uh, if they are in existence, uh, they are doing good for all, not only for themselves. So if they are exploiting natural resources, uh, then uh, there is nothing, no harm. I mean, in, in, in other words, they are uh, you know, manufacturing something which is for everyone uh, to gain from. But very soon when the society at large started realizing that that's not the case, uh, if the objective of cooperation is only to maximize uh, the shareholders' value, then where are other people? I mean, in the civil societies, the employees, the investors, each one of them realize that what is there in it. So it is those things which has evolved over a period of time that today, the you know, apart from the companies, the civil societies, government, investors, they don't trust companies simply because they are uh, in existence. They say that we will, the trust is gone. Now you will have to show us that whatever you are doing is for the benefit of everyone, not only for yourself. It is on these uh, aspects that eventually, you know, the companies also started realizing that if they have to uh, remain in operation, uh, remain in existence, that they will have to show to the people that they are doing their bit so far as environment is concerned, they are, they, they are doing their bit so far as social issues are concerned, and they are also doing that bit to the investors that their governance is equally uh, important because we have seen uh, in number of cases that wherever you know the governance have uh, n not been proper or appropriate, uh, the largest of the corporations have collapsed. So it is these aspects which have become important, and that is what has, in a way. Uh, kind of collapsed into something called ESG. And today, the corporations do not see ESG as a corporate social responsibility. Is It is more of a strategic tool where they position and constantly have to communicate to the people at large that so far as environment is concerned, we are doing our bit. So, so far as uh, doing good for the society is concerned, we are doing our bit. And so far as governance is concerned, investors can rest assured that we are not uh, uh, you know, uh, doing something which will eventually kill the company and they will lose the money. So that's the context in which I guess the ESG is positioned today. Thank you, Sunil. Uh, Smita, would you like to speak about the relevance of ESG for startups? Yes, but uh, let uh, me just give you a quick background also on that, like much before we get into what is, uh, why is it relevant for them. Uh, so as Sunil sir just mentioned, that there is a long history to ESG. Um, he actually stole my punchline there because <laughs> I was trying to talk about it. Uh, most people, most large, uh, most uh, founders that we meet in startup world or otherwise also the enterprises, when I say sustainability to them, 
they are not able to think beyond corporate social responsibility or philanthropy. And I have to clearly tell them, this is exactly not what I'm talking about. That is a small part of it. That's the comfort zone. You very clearly know what numbers to make, where to give, what to do. That's sorted for you, right? That's, all, that's been into practice. And personally, I don't subscribe to the aspect of CSR, but because there is so much good work happening under it, we just let that go on. Sustainability is so much more integrated, has to be integrated in your business operations. We are not talking about giving away free food. That's a part of it. Yes, go ahead, feel free to do that. But we are talking about energy efficiency. We're talking about reducing your waste generation. We're talking about reducing your water footprint. We're talking about equal pay, equal opportunity, being inclusive, not just diverse. So, uh, and, and of course, uh, when it comes to startups, much like a uh, lot of enterprises, they lack awareness on this. So it's very difficult to just go to them and pitch for your work. I work for Fandoro Technologies, which is into uh, uh, working, uh, building adoption and awareness on sustainability for startups and investors. Uh, it's, a, it's a difficult game. But then once this fog is clear as to what sustainability means, it's like, is it even important for us? Like we poor people, uh, cash strapped, less on resources. I mean, we, we, we are struggling for resources. We are struggling for survival. Uh, why should we be looking at ESG at all? And that is where you have to change the lens and say you are not doing something extra for somebody else. What we're going to do here is your own business continuity plan, your own risk assessment and risk management. We are going to make you more successful. And the drive that's actually coming to ES uh, for investor, for startups to actually adopt these uh, ESGs, SDGs, I don't know how many people have heard here, but sustainable development goals, that's the framework I subscribe to. Uh, so I, people actually adopt these things when they hear these terms. And the reason, the, one of the core factors that's actually driving this into startup world are the investors and the customers. Much like enterprises, uh, founder, uh, startups also have the same stakeholders, your customers, employees, your investors, uh, regulatory bodies. So there are two, in, all of these uh, stakeholders are actually driving uh, ESG to startup founders and startups. Uh, I do have to say, while the push is still uh, lesser, uh, but uh, the pace at which things are now changing is so significant that uh, if the startups don't adopt it now, it is going to be very difficult for them to you know, transform themselves, much like the large enterprises find it very difficult. So, so just to decode ESG for startups, what we talk about is when we're talking environment, we are more focused on your supplier sustainability, your environmental footprint across your value chain, from sourcing to distribution. So who are, you, you know, who are your suppliers? What kind of emissions are they making? What kind of emissions you are making? If it is logistics, packaging, whatever. What kind of waste you are generating? How are you recycling, reusing, reducing? How is your uh, e-waste uh, being refiled? Uh, sorry, fi are you filing for your e-waste recycled? Uh, what is your quantity per year? So all of those, and from the social side, uh, one of the most uh, important asset for a startup is its talent. So if they don't have the right people, they are never going to succeed. And the focus on ESG from a social angle actually helps them build those, uh, make, make a more in, uh, inclusive and equitable, uh, 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 I would say, startup or organization to actually make their employees stick around more. Um, from a governance perspective, of course, the board evaluation has become so, so significant. Why is somebody sitting on your board? Earlier, nobody cared. Now it is, if they're not bringing anything to the table, why are they on your board? Why are you even paying them? What's the skill set they have? Do you have somebody who looks into ENS, the environment and social? If you don't have anybody doing that, then you need to add, um, add somebody. And uh, the whole conversation that I, I'll just conclude this, Gayatri, with is uh, when we start talking to startups, we go with the same question that we go to enterprises also sometimes. What is your purpose? If as a business you don't have a purpose and you're not able to marry that purpose to the ESG, then the whole process is going to fail because purpose is your offense. You go and communicate that to the whole world. This is why we exist. If we didn't exist, this would be missing from the world. And ESG is your defense. Then you start proving that you are doing this. Oh. Sorry, thank you. Uh, thanks, Gayatri. It's good to be in this August gathering. I'm really glad that I was invited to this place. Hmm? Hello. Yeah. Yeah, thanks, Gayatri. It's great to be in this August gathering here and uh, wonderful being 
on this panel. After hearing my esteemed panelists, I will try to avoid saying more of the same. And let me share some, uh, something from the media point of view, which may interest some of my young friends here, which is like how to make AG stories break into the newsroom, which is more probably from an operational point of view, which may be useful. You see, you, the USP of uh, EAG's data, what Mr. Sinha referred to, there's, uh, uh, there's a diminishing of trust overall. It's not only in corporates, it's overall in media also, for the matter. And probably EAG, unintended benefit of EAG could be that it could help us to reclaim that trust because it's all about data at the end of the day. Data means a lot, but data in itself doesn't mean sufficiently everything, actually. It's not enough by itself. Every analyst is sitting on gigabytes of data, but he or she does not make it to media because they are not able to analyze it. They don't analyze it. They don't uh, package it properly. They don't do it in interesting kind of packaging. And they don't really reach it out to the media. So that is where they don't make it usable kind of data they have. If packaged interestingly, it can break into news media. If packaged into a report, it becomes a, even a news event. So those are very simple kind of things which make it to help it to make it to media. Now, communicating data itself, which is analyzed, also could be supported with some uh, compelling storytelling, which, of course, uh, all agencies are doing wonderfully well here. And along with it, of course, then reaching out to the media, to the right kind of people. For example, let me take the example of EAG reports. It is a very humbly packaged report, generally. Lots of effort and time and resources go into it, but it doesn't get the kind of respect that is due to it. It's very routine, routinely passed on by PR agencies to media. And what does media do? Media does what it is best at, ignoring it routinely, actually. And why does it do so? Because media doesn't have the uh, resources to really analyze it. It doesn't have the skill sets. It doesn't have the time. It's very resource intensive. And culling out stories from AG reports is a, is a difficult kind of a challenge for them. That is where an opportunity arises for the PR agencies, essentially. Because one, all companies who bring out EAG reports are EAG teams who are domain experts, subject matter experts. They are the best to analyze that data, probably also flag stories there. And apart from that, there are some of the big PR agencies here who themselves have EAG teams internally. So they're well equipped to really analyze it, make it usable by media. Me media doesn't have the EAG expertise at all. I mean, let's, let's be clear about it. They, they have beats, but EAG is something which they are all learning along with other beats, what's happening. Thank you, Rajiv. Let me come back to you. Yeah. And I'll request Arun to uh, make his opening remarks. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Gayatri. And, uh, and, and kudos to, to Gayatri and the, the organizers who, to have actually you know, put together such a diverse panel because which in its, in its true sense uh, you know, reflects the, the, you know, the topic of the session to, and to decode ESG and to have you know, the, the, the communication uh, you know, a world, the, communi the colleagues from the communication world in the room drives home the point that ESG is a, is a journey where no one should be left behind. And that gives a, you know, an important you know, onus for you know colleagues in the in the room from the uh, you know from the, the communication uh, communication background. Uh, the point that Rajiv ji made is an important point about you know building narratives, and uh, a couple of you know points that I would you know highlight, uh, which which should be you know important in our in our minds. Also you know picking up from some of the, the points you know for example trust that Sinaji was mentioning or you know what what sonalji was talking about you know a net zero for a, for a steel industry you know come to think of it you know uh, you you prod uh, sonalji and she would you know start talking about you know why you know deep decarbonization would be you know so much so much required for uh, the the indian steel sector given that you know the demand is is growing at such a rapid pace which is where I, I would believe that ESG becomes an important, you know, constituent for this growth narrative. If we, if we, you know, go back to, you know, the covered decisions of the of the the, the Sharm El Sheikh, uh, you know, climate uh, annual conference of, uh, uh, you know, by by the United Nations, there, it is very very clear that you know the the new kinds of investments, the new manufacturing, you know, uh, capacity. That, that a country like India would need to build 
would need new kind of you know financing and this financing this the way in which the you know the capital markets are today you know analyzing their investments pretty much you know like the you know the, the startup ecosystem you know uh, example that you heard of are today considering the esg esg framework and the role of the of the communication team to you know to translate you know complex data into into the esg uh, esg framework would be a very critical you know element for us to look at you know how the you know the uh, the, the the connections are made and you know the narrative is built without you know, leaving out the uh, leaving out the details it has been 10 years from today where you know the security exchange board of india had mandated you know the top 100 listed companies to you know publish uh, business responsibility report and we have had been an integral part of you know the the, the the national voluntary guidelines which was the foundation for you know the the business responsibility report today the brsr you know uh, the framework that you see and if you should and i would urge the uh, the communication you know uh, you know colleagues to also keep a you know a, a sharp eye on the international sustainability standards board in sharm el sheikh the issb you know celebrated the their second birthday and this is a framework that would bring in you know consist consistent information and which is where you know the exposure for the the communication world to this con this consistent framework would bring a sea change which which actually will make you know uh, sina sabs or you know uh, sonalji's work a lot more lot more easier so that you know agencies like you know rajiv ji and we kind of you know can can bring together more stakeholders thank you thank you arup uh, my next question is actually addressed to both uh, sina ji and to sonal uh, both of you look at let's look at reputational risk corporate reputations you build corporate reputations in one way we build it with you and sina ji builds it in a different way and in a more uh, business integrated base so i just really like you to talk about what is the impact that esg has on reputational risk so the fact that now the questions are coming on uh, so recently in fact uh, day before yesterday i had a question from business standard how much are customers willing to pay extra for my stainless steel products if I uh, guarantee that it is uh, green in process and it's making. And the answer is zero. So currently the dialogue that's happening on ESG and it is so pertinent, but if you go out into the market with your green product and you expect it to, uh, it to you know, give you a premium, that's not the case right now. However, that is the domestic scene. Internationally, uh, you can also, uh, we believe, claim a premium. But the reputational risks are uh, correspondingly much higher. So you cannot be seen as a corporate, yes, yes, irrespective of, you know, the fact that the market is not going to pay you anything extra for your green steel, you have to be uh, process oriented in a way that within a few years you are targeting net zero. All, uh, he quoted the BRSR reports, in fact, I've been, I was in a PSU for almost 10 years and uh, half of my work was only compliance communication. So all of these compliance communications you would take, you know, half of my uh, working hours. And it was so important for the government the back then. Now what was important for government back then has become important for media today. And it is so important that even in interviews, you know, I was recently uh, two years, a year ago I was at IAMC interviewing someone and I saw an IAMC professor here. And one of the girls asked me, what are you doing for uh, eradicating uh, waste? You know, I, I know that steel industry has uh, water discharge or effluent discharge. What are you doing to contain it? And it was impressive. So you can imagine what is the amount of reputational risk or advantage that you can gain from ESG efforts. Yeah, actually, nowadays you see a lot of the younger generation voting with their wallets. They don't buy um, environmentally harmful products and so on and so forth. Yes, yes. Yeah. So the talent retention that uh, my fellow panelists. They don't want yes, to work for yes, companies yes. which are not compliant. Yes. They want you to. They want to know about what are the targets that you're chasing. What what is the environmental goal that you're running with? Uh, so profit alone is no longer a fancy thing, and that is why I talked about the decadal shift, ESG, and all kinds of uh, philanthropic extra profitability work is now in vogue. 
and you have to be seen with a, as a company with a conscience. And there has to be proof of the pudding. Just talking is not going to cook rice now. Uh, well, certainly. I mean, I'll uh, do that. But before that, let me uh, just uh, say something about ESG. You know, I mean, as I said, it evolved more as a philanthropy and so on and so forth. But today, when I look at ESG, now, each of these components, environment, social, and governance, each of these components are strategic and very important for the company. Now, if, they, if a particular company focuses on environmental issues, means if they become more energy efficient, more resource efficient, if they minimize their wastage, etc., it all translates into higher profit. So it's not just that by focusing on environmental issues, you are doing something uh, good uh, in general. All of that can actually translate into a meaningful uh, exercise for you, which ultimately shows up your uh, bottom line. Similarly, look at the social aspect. If you are focusing on the social issues, then it does. It's not only a reputational. I mean, like you know, student uh, when in, in IMC asking, "Are you a zero waste company?" Uh, so that again is something reputational. But otherwise, also I'm saying, when you are vying for customers, we are no longer uh, in an era where our markets are protected. Uh, there is a, uh, you know, a, a severe competition. There are a number of players for the same product. And if you are vying for customers, so if you uh, uh, provide uh, you know, something to them whereby they perceive you, that uh, apart from doing your business, you are also taking care of various issues, whether it relates to the labor, whether it relates to employee compensation, whether it relates to uh, employees' uh, well-being, or whether you, uh, you know, take up some activities which, uh, you know, helps people uh, living in and around your factory areas. All of them actually help you in terms of, uh, you know, not only t uh, grabbing the attention of the customer, but actually translating them into your customer. So all of this, again, plows back to your profitability, your top line, and so on and so forth. And finally, the, uh, you know, the uh, governance issue. Even the governance issue is important because, uh, say, for example, the startups. You know, for many startups, when they go for uh, uh, you know, uh, a round of raising investment, many of the investors would like to know that you know, do you have a strategy to protect the company from the risk which arises because of the ESG issues? Now, if you are able to articulate that, if you have a strategy in and around that, then probably investors would get more interested and you will be able to mobilize funds far easier than otherwise. Or maybe you will be able to mobilize funds at a much cheaper rate of interest or a much cheaper uh, cost than what you will otherwise. So. ESG, if you look at from that perspective, is a pure business strategy. It is no longer philanthropy. It is a pure business strategy. If you integrate it into your operation, it is a win-win for you as well as for your customer, investor, everyone else. Now, coming to the question of uh, credit rating. Now, credit rating typically is about debt products. It's not about the equity. So debt products means that whatever loan you raise, either through the banking channel or through the capital market, that is what gets rated. And the way it has evolved, that ESG issues or ESG risk do not play out in the near term. They play out over the medium to long term. And debt instruments typically are not very long term instruments. They are three years, five years, 10 years. So till now, it was not something which was very much getting factored into the credit rating analysis. But increasingly, as we know that the vulnerability has started increasing because of the climate challenges, et cetera, et cetera, now most of the rating agencies have started looking at it. And also, the regulator, which is SEBI, has come out with a framework where it wants the credit rating agencies to incorporate this particular risk aspect into their analysis. So we are incorporating that into our uh, rating analysis. And wherever we find that this is one of the key rating driver, 
uh, for the credit rating, we mention that, and wherever it is not, we certainly mention it in our uh, press uh, release. Thank you. Um, Smita, would you like to take up what you originally were to talk about, ESG and startups? Why should they talk about it? Uh, why should they get into it right at the start? Yes. Um, see, like uh, again, Sunil sir just stole the starting line on this topic too. Investors are definitely driving it. There are quite a few LPs, the limited partners, who have, uh, when they are giving 200 crores to a VC, 400 crores to another VC. So let's say there is one big LP who's uh, funded uh, 10 uh, venture capitalists and put their foot down that if you don't have an ESG report, you are not allowed to invest. Now, we are not talking about investments, Series C and above. We are talking about as simple as even angel round or Series A. And they put their foot down that if the VCs don't get the ESG due diligence done, you're not going to give the money. So that's one uh, you know, key driver which is pushing this uh, trend in the startups, which are way early in the, their stages, still looking at ESG. However, if you look at it from some other stakeholders like customers, uh, you have EU taxonomy, SFDR, all in Europe. You have uh, the security exchanges in US, which is uh, putting their foot down on a lot of these uh, regulations around climate uh, and ESG. In India, we have our SEBI and MCA working towards BRSR and uh, national uh, guidelines for responsible business conduct. Now, this BRSR, while uh, I, I think Mr. Malik was mentioning about it, we started in 2011 with 100 companies. Today, it is top 1,000 companies. But a very interesting thing that not many people might have read or if they didn't pay attention to is a statement which says, in a time frame of potentially five years, we are looking to expand this to all businesses. So if we don't so want... that includes listed and unlisted. And unlisted. We don't businesses. know. They have said all. That could, as, that could be simply as if you're registered as a business, you have to follow it. Yes. So once that clarity comes in what all means, we don't want a situation that happened in Europe that the moment, uh, you know, a lot of lead time was given to businesses to adopt ESG and they still did not prepare. And suddenly overnight, thousands of businesses were under penalties for not following it, not disclosing it. So startups are, uh, I mean, ESG is relevant for them for, of course, getting, um, opening more investment gates, more customers if they want to work with Western com uh, companies, more talent acquisition because employees want to see the business with purpose. Um, I think uh, it just overall does a lot of investor safeguard also. As simple as not having a fire NOC, which looks very simple, that you are building the work where you're not working, does not have a fire NOC, okay. When we do ESG due diligence for startups, we put our foot down, if you don't have it, we are not going to give a clearance. Why is that? Because if your assets are burnt down, the investor loses the money. So we are playing for the investors. So we, a uh, lot of these things are driving quite a significant awareness and adoption. Essentially, it's an yeah. awareness of the risk of, of operating in a environment which is so uncertain from a climate, social, social and governance perspective that you're looking at putting these risk management practices Beautifully in Beautifully said, Gayatri. I'll just take one minute to also highlight you. Uh, thanks for adding governance to this world because if governance is if not there... If you don't there, have governance, you don't have... Then it doesn't matter how good you're doing on environment, on social, on anything. If you're not having a trustworthy, transparent business, then you might as well just forget the rest of the things. Yeah, yeah. thank you. So, Rajiv, my question, next question is to you. How, do, how does media look at a company which is considered ESG compliant versus one which is not? I mean, let's just say that ultimately it's the media which is the arbiter of good companies versus bad companies in a certain way in terms of perception. So, let's hear it from you. Uh, I don't think those factors play at... Uh in media, whether it's a good company or a bad company, it's a compliance to be done. Yes. That is the presume media would apply generally. So if, if they are doing the compliance and which is generally taken by reports, there's not lots of investigation happening anyway from the media's point of view. But whatever stories are happening, they're very fair and few and far which are happening, say in metals uh, segment particularly. So those are happening. But overall, it's, uh, it's taken as that there is a report uh, by, uh, by an expert, uh, which could be a consultancy generally, so that's taken at face value. So it's a very pretty simple kind of a thing, it's a story which comes to them, and it is backed by data and is backed by a narrative, so it makes its way. Otherwise, uh, I don't see media being an arbiter of whether it's a good company or a bad company. But in terms of if there are any violations which uh, get reported, so those are the ones they would, I mean, at the end of the day, for media, it's a good story or a bad story. Now, good story is, you know, violation is a good story for media. That's what it is. 
and it could be across anything for the matter. So that's what works. Thank you, uh, Rajiv. Uh, Arup, can I ask you to take us through this whole issue of greenwashing and how do regulations look at that and uh, how, again, I'll come back to Sonal and uh, Sunilji for how that impacts reputations. Yeah, uh, and uh, thank you, thank you, Gayatri, for you know bringing the the issue of, of greenwashing, uh, green greenwashing, uh, greenwashing here. Uh, you know, uh, increasingly we have seen that you know uh, with the uh, the labels, ESG labels from you know mutual funds, you know from uh, global funds being stripped off uh, because of the you know. Uh, the enhanced, you know, scrutiny that happens today on, you know, the the impacts that, uh, you know, the the short-term imp impacts and the long-term impact that some of these these funds, you know, uh, claim. I would, you know, strongly believe that, you know, uh, the role of the of the 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 communication, you know, uh, colleagues, the the role of the you know the brand brand management, you know, uh, teams becomes very important you know now now uh, think of it you know it, it is just you know we are just three months away when you know the final communi from you know india's g20 presidency would would come out and unlike any other g20 presidencies today india has uh, the sherpa track on finance is looking at you know esg there is a dedicated you know sherpa track on energy transitions which is just not looking at you know technology, you know transfer, uh, you know technology financing and you know en new energy technologies, but importantly looking at just transitions. Yes. And just transition is a you know is a is, is a concept that you know resonates very well with the the ESG ESG framework. Whereas yeah, and just to define just transitions, just transitions is. Ensuring that when you transit from a fossil fuel based economy to a cleaner economy, we take everybody along. We don't leave anybody behind. So what Arubji is talking about is a strategy that India has uh, been very keen on to take all our marginalized and communities along with us when we transit by creating more green jobs and green, a greener economy. Thank you so much. So if, if these are the things which are, you know, getting at the, the highest pedestal where, you know, so you know, I would argue that, you know, nobody had, you know, stopped, uh, you know, India to imagine what would be the, you know, the, the size of the Statue of Unity. You know, uh, the, the Eiffel Tower or the, you know, the Statue of Liberty was never, you know, a benchmark that, you know, I need to, you know, compete with that or I need to, you know, build that. Today, India is in a, is a, is a different league in the, in the global discourse which gives you know a very high degree of responsibility to you know how the the corpcom the media management you know teams you know view act and you know a progress on the on the esg esg side because at this this point of time and you know will the journey be easy i mean not at all you know to decipher you know a, a financial balance balance sheet we need we needed a century to you know un now understand you know, we, we just look at earning per share from a balance sheet and we know that, you know, what is the financial health. We now today refer to the credit rating, so a triple A plus. So, you know, you, you don't need to, you know, spend any more, you know, time and energy to explain. That, that gives out the, the message. So, from today where we are now, to, you know, to, to bring ESG to this, you know, becoming an uniform language, you know, the journey would be, you know, uh, you know super hard. The, you know, there would be a, a huge degree of, you know, frustration. Gayatriji, from what we also understand, is increasingly ESG will, will become a part of the MCA 21 filings. Yes, it will. And if that happens, you know, from now until, until that point of time, and how do we, you know, you know adopt, you know, digital, digital taxonomy on, on ESG, would be, a, you know, would be a key role Without the involvement of the of the the, the communication <laughs> and and the, and the media team, you know that that won't be uh, that won't be possible. And and Gayatri ji, last it kind of you know these buzzes actually reflect the kind of you know diverse panel that you have put across. <laughs>
where you know time is running out, but the perspectives are you know still to be. Thank you, th thank you for saying that, Arubji. Um, just let it be, just give me two minutes. I'll wrap up. Um, so we've just got into. I'll say we've not even scratched the surface of the subject, but unfortunately we're being asked to wrap up. But um, I will ask one final question of uh, Smita and Sonal. Um, going forward, we see with our clients that speaking of ESG, talking about ESG, putting it in the fo at the forefront of communication is resonating increasingly. Uh, is that the way you see things going forward? In fact, I think communicators have a reason to cheer and so do all the agencies because our role has become very, very important in this age of ESG. These are the kind of events we have to sponsor. This is the imagery that we have to get into. These are the kind of community partnerships we must be into. It was not making as much sense to them as it is making today. So, and like Mr. Sinha said, these are not, you know, short fixes to your image or, you know, just to your visage, this is how I should look. But these are long-term goals in engaging your community better, in retaining your employee better, in having motivational levels go up, in having overall safety hygiene standards be equitable with your global counterparts. And uh, while, yes, media is, uh, like Mr. Tiku rightly said, you know, it is very interested in any negative ESG report that may come out. On the positive side, what media is interested in is any of the green funds that you can garner basis your ESG scorecard. So there is also immense scope for publicity in this area. Thank you so much. I'll just quickly add, I think uh, forget about businesses and everything, media has a very powerful role, PR has a very powerful role in fighting climate change. If you could keep a check on businesses and not let them speak about things they don't do, if you could punch holes into their claims, and I mean, look back in 2021, 2022, whether it is H&M, whether it is Deutsche Bank, whether it is Volkswagen, whether, whether there is so many of these issues which, we have, come, which have come up. Uh, I think you have a very strong role to play in this and uh, startups, businesses use uh, their story on sustainability as a marketing tool. And that's good to do. That's, there's no harm in doing that. But if as, um, as a communication uh, team, which is sit sitting on the other side of the table, I would really like to see more people cross-verify, cross-check every claim that has been made and then publish it and say, yes, these are the good people and these are the people who are actually harmful for the society because they say they're doing good and they're not. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I think before we close, just one uh, final comment. Um, uh, I, as a part of, uh, you know, a group which had rated uh, Indian companies on ESG parameters and launched India's first ESG index on a national stock exchange. It no longer exists, by the way, now. But there we had uh, studied the top Nifty 50 and ESG screened top 50 companies. And we found that in terms of returns, if had you invested in Nifty 50 and had you invested in ESG uh, 50, uh, you would not have compromised on your returns. The returns which Nifty 50 is giving over the years is exactly the same as uh, the ESG 50 is giving. However, once the 2008 crisis happened, thereafter what we found was w the uh, ESG screen companies were giving you even higher return than the Nifty 50. So if you invest in those companies which are ESG screen companies, then as an investor, you do not lose anything. On the contrary, you gain. Just to add to what you said, sir, uh, if you look at a recent RBI report, it says exactly the same thing, that ESG-compliant Indian companies have performed better on the bourses than others. Um, I've been asked to wrap up, so I will. I look forward to hearing more from uh, our community, the communicators' community, about ESG, the need to implement ESG, because a sustainable business, a sustainable business out there is what makes our business sustainable. Thank you so much. Thank you so very much. Ladies and gentlemen, a louder round of applause for this very, very power packed session. Could I please request our panelists to kindly join us up front for a group picture? And also please welcome Mr. Harbinder Narula, CEO of BW Wellness, to present a small token of appreciation to our panelists.